Hi, everybody, and welcome to our May 3rd Thursday um, session with the BC Wine Grape Council Research and Development Committee. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Jose Urbez Torres, who's a research scientist with um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and he's at the Summerland Research and Development Center. He also serves as an adjunct professor in the biology department at the University of British Columbia in the Okanagan. And he's a research affiliate at, at the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute at Brock University. Um, Jose completed his PhD in plant pathology in 2009 at UC Davis. And his research at Summerland focuses on the development and implementation of sustainable management strategies for fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases of grapevines and tree fruits in Canada. And he's here to talk about trunk renewal as it pertains to trunk disease, but I think also as it pertains to winter damage. And so I'm gonna let him start because we're all super interested in this topic this year. Welcome, Jose. Thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you for having me here. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm gonna just yes, share. Let's see if all this goes smooth. Okay. Okay, can you all see the screen good? And hear me okay? Uh, can somebody confirm everything is okay? All good, all good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we have been doing this for, for ages, but still. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, as Kathy mentioned, I'm going to talk about vine renewal and as a, as a tool to, to mitigate and to control grapevine trunk diseases. And I think as, as many of us with the, with the situation we have with the deep freeze experience last January, uh, trunk renewal actually is not going to be only for disease, but also to, to recover uh, the vines that have been have been affected for for this difference. So it's kind of a uh, two 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 topics in in one. So I'm gonna start briefly with some introduction. Many of you know already what happened, but uh, I just want to to have some some background on the on the presentation. These are the two uh, deep freeze events we have. One happening in December 2022. It happened between December 21st and 23rd. And as you can see here, we went down to temperatures, you know, uh, close to minus 23 degrees. Uh, and we have minus 18 degrees uh, during uh, 42 hours. These are the station in, in Summerland at the research station. And the most recently in January, which actually we went uh, even colder. This is the minus 25 degrees and we went, you know, for minus 18 degrees, 57 hours. And you can see here one of the main difference, uh, as Ben Min, for example, has been explaining in, in, in his talks uh, these past days, is we really got a deep freeze very sudden. And we can see how very few days before we, our temperature was almost, you know, five to six degrees. And in a very short period of time, you know, we really decrease, you know, to 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 these lethal temperatures. While in 2022, uh, even though you know we were a little bit more acclimated, you know, we have we were having a little bit more uh, cold temperatures before, and this also can have a significant impact, you know, on the on the status of the vines. Uh, this is the bad hardiness data that uh, Dr. Ben Min and his laboratory collect, as many of you know, through the valley eh, during the winter. And these are 25 varieties where we have the uh, LTE for the bad hardiness as well as the xylem. So during that time, you know, we have an average of minus 21, minus 22 degrees, depending on the bad hardiness of the xylem. And we can see here the average, you know, above, you know, uh, the average in, in throughout the valley. These are all weather stations located from north to south of the valley. And we can see how the average, temp uh, sorry, the, the, the average of the minimum temperature was significantly much higher uh, of the acclimatization of our bats, even our, our silent. We went to minus 26 and minus 27 in January 14. So we passed, you know, the, the acclimatization of those bats. 
And not only that, but the duration of that <clears throat> uh, temperatures were significantly, significantly long. We don't need to have such a low temperatures for uh, bat or by mortality, even lower temperatures in a much longer duration of, of time, it can, it can have an effect. So this is what we have been seeing, of course, you know, uh, after this extreme cold event, we know overall that Vitis vinifera does kind of the threshold minus 23 degrees. Again, it's gonna depend on, on many other factors, but for a long period of time, we are gonna start seeing, of course, more than 50% bad damage. Yeah? It can have uh, a total bad damage. We are gonna have flowing, silent damage and root damage. And, and this is something that also we have to take into, into consideration. Those are all the primary, secondary, and tertiary bats. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Uh, Benmi has provided a lot of information on that in several flyers as well as talks. But basically this is what we have been seeing throughout the valley where all three bats from our, our canes have are necrotic, are dead. Now is when we will start seeing the impact on the flowing and the silent. This is something that in the winter we cannot assess, but you can compare here some of the silent damage in the in the canes eh, and this is a healthy one, or even a bit more deeper, you know, into the silent into the into the trunk. So <clears throat> what what it happened uh, is we are gonna definitely uh, observe and we are knowing that we're gonna have cane trunk and root damage. Uh, flowing damage may be reparable, and we have seen in previous uh, call events where, you know, we have seen some parts of the vine, you know, declining with poor vigor, but overall the vines can recover this flowing damage. However, the silent damage is irreversible, and, and the, 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 in many occasions, if any shoots will come out in the, in the spring, they most likely will collapse. These are just some pictures I have from samples we were assessing in the freeze we have in 2022 in December. In this particular block, it went down to minus 25.5, the minimum for three consecutive days. And this is the very significant silent damage we have. This is totally irreversible. We cannot recover that. One interesting thing on that uh, freeze event, and you can see here is, you know, you can see above this line how the silent is completely dead and necrotic, but below this line is still green and healthy. And that's one of the difference we have versus the freeze in 2022 versus the previous one, the, the, <clears throat> the most recent one. We have a snow cover. This block has about over a foot, uh, a foot of a snow cover. And basically we can see where the snow was covering these trunks, all the um, asylum and, and tissue was, was alive. Unfortunately, the deep freeze event we have in January, most of the vineyards in the valley have none or very, very minimum snow cover. Uh, and that is gonna play also a role on we are gonna be talking today about the, the latent bats pushing. So what we know right now, based on bad dissections and, and assessment, is probably in most of the valley, we are going to see between 90 to 100% bad mortality. And that includes the primary, secondary, and tertiary bats. So those bats from the canes that we were uh, living uh, last year are uh, uh, most, of, most of them dead. So <clears throat> the next step is assess the vine mortality. And this is what we are currently doing uh, under evaluation. One. Once the, the grapevine breaks dormancy, we are gonna be able to assess the viability of these silent and flowing vessels and, and the conductivity. So this is just an example. So we are gonna be looking is these dormant bats. These pictures were taken actually yesterday at the Summerland Research Station. And one of the things we did in Summerland is most of uh, all of our blocks are trained double cordon spur prune. So basically knowing that most of our bats, you know, in the cordons were gonna be uh, dead we got the cordons and we were basically trying to uh, enhance but dormant bats pushing either at the head in the trunk or at the base so these are some of the the life that we could see in the vineyards yesterday and you can see all these latent bats pushing you know usually on the on the base of spurs they are they are embedded in the bark it's very very difficult to find these 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 bats um uh, not like the normal bats we have on the on the canes and is my understanding of an expert, but thanks, we have been in here to answer any of these physiologic questions, but we still don't understand very well, you know, the, 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 the physiology of these bites and how they push. So just to give you some data, uh, we did some inspections. Actually, those were done yesterday on May 15 in the Summerland Research Station, and we have here different blocks uh, that I, I named the block and the cultivar. 
and the vines that were inspected and vines that at least we see one or more uh, latent batch pushing. So we can see Chardonnay cell rooted. You know, most of the vines, you know, over 90%, you know, were showing uh, these latent bats, primary in the trunk and the head on the cordon. Chardonnay on 3309, very similar, you know, 95% of the vines, so live uh, and, and bats. Merlot on 3309 uh, in the two blocks we have, very, very similar. One of the main difference Merlot versus the Chardonnay is the bats were showing mostly only at the base of the trunk. And that's something that we were observing, you know, comparing to the Chardonnay, whether it was uh, rooted or or, or grafted. Um, I, I don't understand why, but maybe Benjamin can give some, some uh, explanations for that. But we were obviously seeing uh, um, uh, the bats only at the base of the trunk. And then Merlot, and I put interrogation mark because we uh, don't really know the, the graph union in this old Merlot block in the in the station. This Merlot actually have very, very low amount of vines alive. Only 14% uh, of the vines were, were alive. So we are seeing differences, you know, depending on our Sion uh, Rusto combination, but also depending on the location of the block. A little bit more in depth. This is the other blocks we have in the research station. I should mention that the blocks I showed you before, those are located up high on the hill where the where the station is. These blocks are the ones who are across the highway uh, next to the uh, to the lake. And we have three main varieties, Chardonnay, Merlot, and Pinot Noir. And actually, some of these blocks were uh, planted. Uh, that's why I divided here in young vines versus mature vines. And you can see here, for example, Chardonnay on 3309. Uh, we have a very high rate of uh, survival. Those are vines that were showing bats in the um, in the either the base, the trunk, or the head. But uh, still, you can see that the young vines uh, show a higher mortality than the mature vines. Most of the van the bats were showing either uh, across the trunk or uh, at the head. You know, with only fifty percent of very minimal bats showing at the base of the trunk. If we go with the Merlot, and this Merlot uh, has uh, different rootstocks. Uh, it was a rootstock trial that it was uh, planted uh, back in the days. The young vines, you know, so uh, a similar trend. They have uh, much less bats at the base, and most of the bats are concentrated in the along the trunk or the head. Um, and we have actually a significant uh, su uh, survival, but much more survival on the mature vines. Almost 100% of the vines survive uh, in, in, in the mature Merlot. And again, most of those bars were either at the trunk or the head, which is going to facilitate our, our trunk renewal. Finally, the, we have a young block of Pinot Noir and, you know, very, very similar. Almost 90% of the vines were showing life uh, signs and most of those bats were located in the trunk or in the head. So there is uh, hope out there, <laughs> I would say, uh, after, after what we have experienced. We are going to conduct a, a survey of the same blocks in the next following weeks because we know that depending on the silent and flowing damage these vines may have, those shoots actually are going to start collapsing. And that's one of the main things that we are going to be seeing in the next two or three days. We are not expecting that all those bats will really survive and develop into shoots. There will be a significant amount of, uh, of collapsing of those, of those bats. So right now, after this string call event, the consequences, you know, we know we have two options. And very unfortunately, we are going to have to pull out and replant, which, you know, we know how significant cost that uh, represents to the grower. Uh, but also we can uh, start working on the renewal, you know, from those latent bats. And that's what I'm going to try to explain uh, in the in the next slides. So by now, uh, I would say that most of the growers will have at least, you know, prune the old uh, canes and have something like that. Basically, you have your cordon, you know, where where you have prune either either eliminating all the all the spurs or maybe at least a tuba spurs. So those green uh, figures I have here, I'm um, simulating where these dormant bats may start pushing. So we may start having dormant bats pushing uh, in the cordon between the spurs, at the base of the spurs, at the head, in the trunk, or at the base. And that's what we have been assessing. So if successful, you know, and those uh, uh, dormant bats start pushing and creating shoots, we will be able, hopefully, to replace those spurs. But depending on the situation and the amount of bats, uh, we may have to focus either on bats on the head, in the trunk, or at the base. Some other growers may have uh, um, 
decide, as we did at the research station, to basically cut the uh, cordons. This would be also what maybe a cane prune vine would look like uh, if, if you don't have a spur prune uh, uh, in double cordon. And here, basically, we are really trying to enforce the growth of our dormant bats in the head, trunk, or the base. You know, if we have these bats here, we will either retrain the new cordons coming uh, or depending, it's going to be depending the amount of bats we are, have pushing. And the most drastic solution would be, you know, of course, to cut all the way to the back, uh, to the bottom of the vine and trying to hope that those buds, either whether you are self-rooted or above the graft union, are gonna still be alive and push and we will retrain you know, our, our new uh, trunk and from there go on. So this is a very difficult choice uh, and uh, to, to decide what to do you know, in, the, in the pruning time. In the, in, a lot of talk has been going on in the last couple of months. And for what I observe in the in the vineyards uh, in the Okanagan, most of the growers have decided either this option or this option, where you know I think it's very wise because we still don't know where those bats are gonna be start pushing. As I show in the tables before, it's gonna be a big variability where those bats are gonna be pushing. It's gonna depend on your cultivar. It's gonna depend on your um, uh, rootstock ion combination and and etc uh, etc. Et so I think these two options right now are the wisest ones to uh, start seeing what are these bats are going to be pushing and select our our uh, future vine. Many of you probably uh, when have been pruning and and doing this type of work have you start seeing these type of symptoms. You know whether you have been seeing them these symptoms, these cankers. These are uh, cankers in the spurs, in the cordons. You know when we have been chopping these cordons or all the way down to the um, to the trunk. So these are perennial cankers and these are caused by fungal pathogens, and that's where I'm coming into. Uh, part of my talk with the correlation we are going to have with the renewal and the grapevine trend diseases. So these cankers are caused by fungus that are in the grapevine trend disease complex. And I know you probably most of you have seen, but uh, these slides, I just want to, to, to get a very brief introduction for some of you maybe are not so familiar. But the grapevine trend disease are caused by many different fungi. Uh, there is not just uh, one pathogen, one disease, like can happen with powdery mildew or botrytis. Here we have more than 100 different fungi that can cause these, these diseases. So that's why we consider it as a very complex disease. They're going to infect grapevines through pruning guns and openings. You know, any opening that we do in a vine can be a source of infection for our, our uh, trend diseases. But of course, we prune vines every year. So that's where we are going to start seeing our first infection are going to be in our pruning guns in the either at the head of the vine in cane prune vines or at the spurs in cordon prune vines. Depending the pathogen we have or the disease or the complex and combination, we are going to see a rapid or slow decline of the vine. This is an example, you know, of a canker, how, for, for example, probably was starting in the last spurs and slowly has been progressing. And you can see this decline, you know, uh, at the same as the canker advances. And eventually, you know, uh, of course, it will cause the entire uh, death of the plant. Uh, we are not special to any other region. Uh, grape vine trends occur wherever grapes are grown. And the only difference are going to be uh, on the pathogens that are some of them specifically found uh, more prevalent in one region than the others. So just to understand a little bit what's happening and how these uh, fungi infect grapes. Uh, so we have first one uh, inoculum or the primary inoculum can come from infected nursery material. And this has been well demonstrated. We have done a significant amount of work here in, in Canada to understand the health status of the vines, you know, being, being planted in Canada. So that can be a source of the infection. But once we have it in the in the field, you know, in these uh, symptomatic uh, infected areas, we are going to find these fruiting bodies. These are the structures containing the spores of the fungus, and these spores under optimum environmental conditions, uh, uh, temperature, and mostly also humidity and rain, are going to be discharged. Are going to be either airborne or also transport by uh, rain splash are going to be landing in our spurs, uh, in our pruning guns on spurs, trunk, and cordon. So. The, the spores are going to germinate, are going to start colonizing, creating these cankers that, depending on the, the pathogen, can grow very rapidly or slowly. And we are going to start seeing the declining and, and these symptoms in the vines. Uh, 
Uh, this is even more complex because they this fungus uh, this fungi not only affect grapes but also many other hosts. Whether you know there are uh, uh, crops that we uh, have in the in the valley, you know, cherry and apple would be some of the main ones, but also some native plant communities. We have found some of these pathogens in more than eighty different uh, uh, hosts. So with this said. How we can control these diseases, and this is something that I think is very relevant to the situation we have right now. So now we are gonna. This has been a lot of talk about what I should choose right now to replace my vineyard after this this freeze event. We have been talking about well, should we look for more um, um, resistant or tolerant uh, varieties to cold? It has been also the talk about uh, planting hybrid, which you know uh, has a little bit more tolerance to the cold. So, in terms of of grapevine trend disease, which is something that we are all affected, uh, the bottom line is all Vitis vinifera species are susceptible, including some of the wild Vitis species. They have some studies conducted in the United States where you know some of the uh, native uh, uh, American um, uh, species have been some susceptible. What we have seen here is a significant uh, variability in the susceptibility depending on the um, cultivar you have. This is data actually I've been provided by one of my colleagues, Dr. Marshall Noski, who is one of the top experts also on trans diseases in, in working in, in Australia. And they did a big trial on varietal susceptibility at the Germa plants collection they have in the Barossa Valley. I wanted to highlight here, these are red cultivars, you know, and these are some of the five top red cultivars in the Okanagan Valley. We have Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah, which we will consider they are at the at the high end of the susceptibility. So these varieties are highly susceptible to trans diseases. We have Merlot and Cabernet Franc, who are, you know, intermediate, medium. Merlot is actually known to be low susceptible. And for example, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is one of the varieties that is considered less susceptible. We have other varieties that we use, for example, for sparkling, like Pinot Meunier. We have also some varieties growing in the valley, like Petit Verdot, which are at the low end. So you can see the significant difference in susceptibility. So when 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 deciding on, on cultivars, this is another type of information we should uh, take into, uh, into consideration. Regarding white cultivars, is the very similar. So I try to highlight here some of the most common grown in the valley uh, regarding white. So Sauvignon Blanc, highly demanded right now. Uh, this is probably the most susceptible white cultivar, you know, in uh, against trans diseases. We have Bionier, you know, medium susceptibility, and they at the low end, we have Chardonnay. So Chardonnay actually widely planted in the valley, has lower susceptibility. And, you know, Pinot Gris, which I believe is becoming one of the most uh, popular and planted in the valley, or Semillon, are in the much, much lower susceptibility. All these uh, uh, varieties will be infected, eh? but one of the difference is the progression of this canker in the wood will will be faster in the highest susceptible varieties or much, you know, slow growing in the least susceptible varieties. So we are also fortunate to have some data regarding the clone. It has been, you know, um, same study uh, conducted in Australia. They have conducted uh, susceptibility depending on the clone. So for example, we can see here Cabernet, Sauvignon, or Sauvignon Blanc, not so much different, you know, regarding the susceptibility of the clones, some of them at the, at the you know, lower end of susceptibility. But overall, you can see here that the clone may not have such influence in Cabernet Sauvignon and similar maybe in Sauvignon Blanc, you know, and that's probably why also these varieties are, you know, on the very top of susceptibility against gray wine transition because not even the clone has a, a, a difference. However, if we look, for example, on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, we can see that are actually a significant variability depending on the clone we are using in, in, in either of these diseases, you know, going with Chardonnay with some of these clones being really, really low, low susceptible or, or in the Pinot Noir. Again, that's why probably these varieties are also are in the either medium susceptibility or in the lower end of susceptibility. So... I, I talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the cultivars. So we, uh, I mean, it's a very difficult choice because we don't, we not only are gonna have to maybe choose cultivars that are more, you know, tolerant or less susceptible to cold, but also the disease can play a, a big role on it. And not only trans diseases, you know, we have, for example, powdery mildew, and we know how also difference in, in cultivar susceptibility we can find with powdery mildew. 
So the the one of the main problems we have with trans disease is the effective products we have in the past that we uh, we could actually you know uh, treat the plants and they would stop the the canker inside the plant are no longer available. Those have been either banned or or phased out, mostly because of the the high um, impact they have on 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 human health or or, or the environment. So right now we don't really have any product that we can stop the canker eh, and cure the vine once this infection happened. And so the only solution we have is what we call remedial surgery or trans renewal. I will be using these terms interchangeably here. Um, uh, and then that's why the most of the control studies are right now focused on um on on, on protecting the pruning wounds. You know, we have to protect these pruning wounds, which are the main point of entrance for our uh, for this uh, uh, fungi. Just to give you an idea, you know, on the different types of uh, products that are out there available, we have paint at paste, you know, that they are create a physical barrier. Some of these paints can have actually a fungicide, which actually increase the effect and uh, efficacy of these this paints and paste because it's not only the barrier, but also the effect of the, of the fungicide. They have to be hand applied, so they are much highly cost. We have the fungicides, you know, you can apply basically to all the boons, you know, they are applied by uh, sprayers. And then we have organic, you know, and more and more we are having more organic and actually quite quite effective. Some of the work we have done here, for example, in, in BC, uh, we have shown that some of the organic uh, microorganisms we have found, they are, uh, they have similar or much better efficacy than, than, than fungicides. These are just an, a, a list of uh, products that they are registered either in Australia, New Zealand, or in California. You can see the, the large number of products they have uh, available in those in uh, growing regions. So what is the situation in BC? Well, uh, uh, the, the studies we have done, uh, we found a very significant amount of, uh, basically almost every block that we were going into, we were finding signs and symptoms of grapevine trans diseases. We found overall about 10% of the plants uh, grown in BC showing foliar symptoms, and these are not counting you know, internal symptoms. But these uh, are gonna be very variable depending on the blocks. We have, you know, jam blocks where we have over, you know, 40% uh, of the plants uh, infected and showing symptoms and mature blocks, you know, usually those that they are much older and mature blocks with almost 80% of the plants infected. And you can see here in this graph, how usually the older the block, the much higher number of plants you're gonna have infected, basically because the fungus is, of course, you know, uh, growing towards uh, the wood. Uh, and all their plants are going to have, you know, a much significant amount of canker. We actually, in collaboration with uh, growers here, have done a very recent uh, study and evaluated, you know, uh, as a consequence of this deep freeze event. And, you know, we are going to be working on retraining. And the, as I explained before, the retraining is going to come in many occasions from the base. You know, we are going to cut that trunk and try to get those buds pushing from the base to retrain. We found that 100% of evaluated blocks, eh, and this has been done in the last two months, eh, 200 blocks were evaluated, so canker symptoms at the base of the trunk. These are just an example of different pictures. Eh, and the block age that uh, those uh, were conducted were between four and 30 year old. So there's a big uh, range of age and what really surprised me here is we are seeing uh, blocks in the Okanagan less than 10 years old where the canker has already reached, you know, the, the bottom of the of the of, of the trunk, which is quite surprising to me because uh, usually you start seeing those diseases reaching the trunk even, you know, when they are 10 odd years or older, depending on the, the, the pathways we have. But in this case, we observe this situation, which is not, of course, uh, um, nice. So one of the main things is why uh, my hypothesis is because we haven't had absolutely any product for 30 years here in, in British Columbia to protect this pruning wound. So those vines that have been even planted, you know, in the early 90s, they have been exposed to these uh, fungal spores over and over and over. So, you know, right now, most of our vineyards are going to be between these 20, 35 year old, and those all have been infected. And because we haven't been able to protect these pruning wounds, that's the situation we are seeing. You know, we are seeing all these cankers all, all the way down to the to the trunk. 
Uh, fortunately, and thanks to work we have been doing uh, in collaboration with Manor U, CPMRI, at the Samela Research Station, we have conducted trials and so and provide um, efficacy data. This is the first actually product that has been registered in Canada for grapevine tran diseases. It's Senator, it's a tiofanatemethyl, and it's a very um, um, effi it's a very efficient. This product is is uh, actually one of the advantages this product has. It has a much wider range of the pathogens that can affect. So um, we I, I actually conduct uh, quite a lot of work on this product in California while I was there. And one of the things we saw is it can actually target many of the different pathogens affecting transitions. So this product right now is registered to use in um in, in British Columbia. But also another factor I think that is important to understand and why we are seeing maybe more of our vines with this infection is we believe that the climatic conditions that our viticulturist CBC may favor this uh, faster disease progression. This is just some data showing some of the work we have done, for example, evaluating the water stress and drought. Uh, we have done both greenhouse and field studies. And basically the home time measures here is we observed that vines under drought or, or water stress uh, were enhancing and favoring the development and the growth of the grapevine trans disease fungi, in this case, Phimonial acclamidosporea. We can see that those vines under heavy stress were having a much higher amount of uh, fungus. But we have been talking a lot about, you know, uh, heat dome, uh, water stress, drought, uh, but we have mm, been paying very little attention maybe at what the cold temperatures may, uh, you know, the role they may play on disease progression. You know, we are we are in, a, in an area where we can go from both extremes, you know, minus 20 degrees in, 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 in the winter to 40 degrees in the summer. So I think uh, viticulture is under heavy stress in this in these areas, and this is something that we would like to to explore uh, further. So now, uh, as I mentioned, you know we have this situation with the vine renewal. Not only we are going to have to renew our vines to continue having production due to the deep freeze event, but we are going to have to deal most likely with this situation in the vast majority of the blocks. So that's where I come and I'm talking about the work we have been doing with uh, remedial surgery or trend renewal. That's, that's, that's what I mentioned. And that's the only solution we have right now to cure infected vines. As I mentioned before, we don't have any product. We don't have absolutely anything we can spray systemic into the vine that is gonna stop this uh, canker and this fungus progressing. So basically what uh, is, is very simple, uh, the, the, the technique, we, uh, and it's based on eliminating and putting off the disease boot until you know reaching healthy tissue. So we can have an infected vine where you know we are going to start cutting you know uh, sections of the vine. Uh, of course, if the infection has started in the cordon, that's where the fungus has been acting for a much longer time. So our canker is going to the canker area is going to be much higher in this. And as the canker progressing, you know, towards uh, downward towards the soil, we continue cutting, you know, we see less canker, less infection until hopefully we are going to reach an area where it's going to be clean or mostly clean with no signs of infection. Usually it's uh, recommended that when we reach the, uh, this area, we still go about 10 centimeters more because we know that the fungus can still be active, even though we don't see the the symptom so the fungus can be ahead uh, of, of that symptom so what are our advantages and disadvantages regarding this remedial surgery or trend renewal well one of the main thing is uh, we can retain you know the same clone or the variety we have in many old blocks or old vineyards we may not be able even to 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 find that specific clone we were we were using we are going to have a very well developed and established root system if we do that. You know, if we are doing this work in a 15 or 20 year old vine, that root system is going to really support the growth of these new shoots, you know, that we are replacing. So in some occasions, you can actually, as I will show later, be back in production the following year. And of course, you know, uh, you're going to have a much higher success if vines are self-rooted. And that's just the fissure of the vine, how much more water shoots or these uh, dormant bats are going to be pushing from the bottom of the of the vine. If we are grafted, you know, we are very limited to get those bats pushing above the graft union. And in many occasions, uh, the graft union actually may diminish, you know, uh, or have an influence on the production of those bats. 
The disadvantage, well, it's very labor intensive, as you can imagine, and you can have high, you need high skilled workers, you know, that they know where, are, what they are doing and, and why they are cutting and, and, and at what point. It's highly costly. It can cost, you know, uh, these are studies conducted in California in, in 2008, but it can be over $2,000 an acre. And of course, better results that during the dry season period, because we are not going to have the sports. We are going to be opening a big boom. If we are doing this work in a dry uh, season period, we are going to hopefully avoid that that big boom is going to get reinfected. So I'm going to show here some studies that my colleague uh, Mars Hosnowski conducted in Australia, I think are very relevant and he graciously uh, allowed me to present this data. So I mentioned you before how the idea is to start cutting, you know, the, the sections until you find a healthy, healthy boot. Uh, but that can be very, very time consuming. You can spend, you know, 10, 20, 15 minutes in a vine just trying, you know, to, to, to go with a chain shot to look that. So basically what they were trying to show here is the differences. What happens if you have a high cut, you know, in this case, basically just cutting, you know, uh, on the top where the cordons are coming, have a cut medium of the trunk or have a very low cut. So in infected vines, what they uh, observe, you know, these are <clears throat> uh, either the symptoms in the vines or the amount of stain when, when they did this, this cut. Of course, when you are doing this high cut here, you're gonna find much more uh, canker or symptoms in those vines because that is where the disease has been reached, you know, first coming from the spurs or, or the cordon and it has been acting for a much longer time. But you can see here that the lower you do the cut, the much less symptoms you're going to find. Why? Because the, the depending the age of those vines, the fungus still has some time to reach the bottom. So they found that if you do uh, a cut directly at the bottom, a low cut, you're going to find a much higher number of, of vines without the stain. Here, in this case, only 20% of the vines they cut have a stain at the bottom. So home take message in this case, you know, if you are suspecting of your trend disease and you start chopping those those vines and you see that you are reaching to a point that is going to take too much time, just go directly making a low cut. Just go directly to try to retrain that vine from from the from the very bottom. Another good point for that, eh, and this continuing with some of the results they have, we can see here, you know, vines that they were uh, reworked in 2002 in this uh, field trial in Australia. And you can see here a vine that it was, you know, uh, cut at the top in two years after the vine was still okay, was uh, uh, producing. Here you can see at the bottom a vine that was, you know, basically cut from the, from, uh, uh, at, the at the very bottom. Well, if we go five years later, the vine they did the cut on the top was completely dead, mostly because the canker, you know, here was so big uh, and, and cover most of the area that, you know, completely um, stopped the, 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 the conduction of water and nutrients. However, you can see here that those vines that they were cut, you know, at the very bottom, they were still producing and, and having a quite a good vigor and, and crop. And you can see here all these holes, you know, through the through the block for all these vines that the cut were done either at the top or in the middle. So we are going to have a much higher success if we go all the way to the bottom because we are going to be eliminating the vast majority of this of this canker. So as I mentioned before, this would be the ideal situation. We are going to find hopefully healthy boot, you know, and we are going to be able to retrain and that vine can be, you know, in production for, for, for many more years. However, based on the very recent data we have, this is the real situation we have in BC, where unfortunately we are seeing that the vast majority of our blocks are going to have, you know, the stain all the way at the very bottom of the, uh, uh, of the trunk. So the other situation is, well, what are we going to do now with that? We cannot find this healthy boot that we can retrain and for the vine again. So that's where we come, you know, and we did a study here in the in the Okanagan. So um, uh, we wanted to see the effectiveness of remedial surgery under the conditions we are having in the Okanagan, where we are seeing that most of the vines, you know, most of these blocks 10 years old and you know, older are infected at the very bottom. Can we still renew these vines? How how long, you know, uh, these vines will continue producing, knowing that they are even infected, you know, because the, the infection has reached the bottom. One of the ideas behind is, of course, you know, 
avoid the entire block being pulled out. You know, suddenly, you know, a grower find the situation we have and it has to pull out 20 acres well. You know, you, you have the cost of the pull out plus the replanting cost plus the entering production cost. And you have to eliminate all that and not being able to get a cash return in three, four years. That's a significant, significant uh, take. Very similar to what we are observing right now with the deep freeze where these decisions are going to have to be made. So if successful, you know, if we can uh, have these vines still growing for a while and producing, well, the grower can maintain production in those blocks while having a plant, you know, replanting the block progressively in stages, you know, don't doesn't have to do everything at the same time. So we uh, work in three different blocks, and that's what we are serving in these blocks. We were observing, you know, these were all blocks uh, that it gets to a point, you know, when we started our research uh, that the production was significantly decreasing. The grower called us to these blocks, uh, and and was asking me, well, Jose, my my production overall in the entire in the entire state is is really declining, and I don't really know 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 why. And you can see, you know, how you can go from, you know, 2013, 2016, this deep, deep decline. We started to cut vines and very unfortunately, we saw the reality and the reality is the vast majority of those vines have a significant amount of canker at the very bottom. Those were all vines. Um, so we we are reducing, of course, the amount of uh, uh, nutrients and, and water that can be uh, translocated to the to the top. So we designed an experiment, and in this case, as I said, we have three different vineyards. We have a Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, and Pinot Noir. All these were self-rooted, and I have to, to mention this to, to, to be clear. And we have the treatment. So the treatments consisted on conducting remedial surgery. So we have cut the vines 20 to 30 centimeters above the ground. We knew that all the vines had cankets at the very bottom. So we just were hoping that these 20, 30 centimeters will give us you know, enough uh, uh, bats uh, pushing. And we have our uncut controls. So we have 30 vines per treatment divided in 10 panels of three vines each, you know, and that's the how we're distributed aleatory in the entire blocks. And basically what we have was one, one panel, you know, uh, with uh, five vines. So we have two guard vines and took the measurements in the middle. These are our uncut control vines, and these are the vines we cut and we were to try to retrain. Important things is the grower was committed to conduct this work, not only in this research trial, but in the entire state. So actually uh, what he did is the year before the cut in 2016, he started to try to develop these water shoots and try to have water shoots coming from the bottom to be able to select the best water shoots. So that's something that I really uh, advise if you are going to do uh, to, to this work is, you know, working a year ahead to try to develop these water shoots the year before, not wait to cut and see what is coming. That, that's a significant advantage. So the canker area was measured both at the head and at the bottom of the of these uh, vines. We isolate the, the, the pathogens that they were actually uh, causing these cankers. And then we have from 2017 to 2022, we were taking plant health measurements as well as yield and fruit quality data. The trail was completed in 2022, and that's where our control vines, you know, were cut, and then we were measuring again the canker in those control vines. So this is how you know the trial looks like. These are these panels, you know, with the two car vines. This is the control, the uncut vines in the middle, and these are you know our cut vines as you can see here. You know, two shoots were left, you know, uh, the year before. These cuts were done actually in winter of 2017. And you can see here how the canker was already in the in the in the bottom of the of the vine. So we did measurements and we we observe uh, it was it, it, we we have the canker area at the top was much higher at the bottom. Again, these vines are came pruned, so the infections we don't really know when the infection started. But even if the infections have been working for fifteen or twenty years, the fungus has had way more time, you know, to colonize the wood at the head, and that's why the canker surface area is much higher at the at the at the top. And when we were cutting at the bottom, the average were actually not not terribly bad. I mean, we have about, you know, between 25 and 30 percent of that canker area, but you can see there's a still significant amount of live tissue there that can support growth. This is what was uh, really, really uh, shocking to see how many different fungi associated with grapevine trendices were able to pull out from that, you know, just those three blocks, you know, in, in groups of the, the, these are what we call the Utypa dieback group, Facremonium would be the ESCA group, and then we have other cankers like Cytospora, Diplodia, or the Aporte. But that makes actually sense because the vast majority of the fungus 
found were within the Utaipa dieback. And we know that these are a slow progressing uh, fungus. They are very different than, for example, Diplodia de Botrysphaia, that are much faster growing fungus. And that's why probably these uh, vineyards are still quite old, 25, 30 years old, they were still having you know, significant amount. And that's why I mentioned that it really matters the type of fungus you're gonna have infected your vines. So the results we obtained, you know, these are results for the Pinot Gris. These are the yield grams per, per vine. And here we have in blue, these are the control, the uncut vines. And in red, those are the vines that were cut. So of course, the year after, eh, you are, we, we were still observing a much higher amount of crop in the uncut control vines, but we already got crop in our cut vines. As I mentioned before, we were leaving already these water shoots the year before. So those water shoots, the grower were selecting, you know, the best ones to move for the following year. And we were already obtaining about a kilo per, per vine, which is, you know, uh, quite, quite, quite significant. 2018, you know, uh, both treatments were kind of balanced, no significant difference, but we were already seeing the increase on our uh, cut vines and the decrease in these cut vines. 2019, two years later, we already saw that our cut vines have a significantly higher uh, amount of crop, about 2.5 kilos per vine versus 1.5 on the... And then we have 2020 and 2021, where still our cut vines have, you know, uh, more yield, a higher yield than the uh, control vines. However, these years, we believe that, we believe that some of these uh, reasons, you know, a very poor food set in 2020 or the heat dome in 2021 have a significant effect on the on the amount of yield we, we saw. 2022, again, we came to a normal growing year, whatever you can call normal these days, but we saw that our cut vines have almost doubled the amount, you know, of crop versus our um, uh, control on cut vines. So it was really significantly working, getting a much uh, higher um, crop. In terms of the parameters in, you know, fr fruit quality parameters, no significantly different. So this new crop we are getting in these cut vines were comparable to the old vines. Uh, no significant difference at all on that. And in the pruning ways, we can see, of course, how we have a much higher vigor and 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 prune and pruning ways in the cut vines and the uncut vines. Very, very similar results on our Pinot Noir. Unfortunately, we lost the, the grower harvest before we were able to get our data in 2018 or 19. But again, we were able to have crop the year after. You know, the same situation we believe happened here because of the conditions, but even, you know, at the end of the trial, we were able to see how much significant amount of crop. And we are talking these vines that were planted in 1991. I mean, these are, you know, uh, quite significant uh, old vines. Same situation with the fruit quality parameters as well as the pruning weights. So we observed that the trend renewal, it worked. And it was actually allowing the grower to have production during all these years. So didn't have to entirely commit the first year to pull out the entire block. And what it was looking basically was every year was doing a small section of each block, replanting, and it was gaining time, you know, and, and, and still having a cash flow with the production. So when we finished the, the experiment, eh, we cut the control vines and we saw a significant increase in the canker area. These are the vines that we were cut, you know, the top at the bottom in 2017. And just an example of the pictures, the vines were cut in 2023. So we actually observed that in this short period of time, six, seven years, the canker area almost doubled, you know, and, and I don't really understand why, um, you know, this very, very fast uh, growing of the, but we also, we look back uh, in these past five, six years, the amount of significant stress that we have been having in our vineyards in the Okanagan with, you know, uh, you name it, with heat domes, drought, uh, fires, et cetera, et cetera, it could play, you know, why this, this pathogens has been moving so fast in the last in the last years. But we can see that this control that they were uncut basically wouldn't have too much more life, you know, maybe one or two more years. And they, with this amount of light tissue, they will most likely collapse, you know, in the summer. Uh, uh, there, there is almost no light tissue to support the vegetation. So overall, we can see here uh, in these two blocks, this is the Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, this is the total kilos per hectare the grower was having. When we started the trial, you know, in 2016, you know, when those vines were cut in, in January 2017, the grower got uh, five, uh, five tons per hectare, 7.5 tons per hectare. At the very end of the trial, we basically 
almost double, more than double the amount of crop uh, that the grower was getting from the 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 renew the renew vines, even though they were they were actually um, um, infected at the very bottom. So quite successful, uh, and the grower was able to get back in significant production. Uh, but still, you know, uh, I, I remind the grower that those vines eventually will die. So it was actually having a plan for replacing those those blocks slowly at different stages. These are just some examples of these vines, how they look like. These are with control and cut vines. And you can see even how poor vigor and even the, the color of the foliage is, is, is quite chlorotic. You know, barely find a couple of clusters while our cut vines at the end of the trial, you know, were able to support a quite significant amount of fruit. Remember, you're going to have a very, very significant root system here is able to support these two or three trunks that you maybe would want to retrain. Another example, you know, of uh, uncut vine at the end of the trial, it was the harvest of 2022. Very few cluster, very poor uh, grow, poor vigor. You know, most of the country is actually avoiding this uh, transporting of, of water and, and nutrients, while the cut vines have quite successful uh, uh, thrive and, and producing. I just wanted to show this slide because our data actually, you know, confirms what uh, similar studies have done in New Zealand. Those are retrained renewal uh, studies from my colleague Marcel Snowski that they conducted in three varieties: Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. And you can see how at the end of this trial, you know, the cut, you know, uh, renewed uh, vines were having a, a significant higher crop that, you know, the decline in, in, in yield of the uncut uncut vines. So. This technique works, you know, and it is, it's quite successful. Another question we get is, well, uh, what is the production of these uh, water shoots? You know, um, well, the factors affecting these water shoots can be very many different factors, you know. And for example, again, this research that I, my colleague shared with me to show you today, they look into cultivar. So we can see here the production of water shoot is going to depend, you know, uh, on the cultivar we are having. Pinot Noir Malbec has a much higher, you know, uh, production of water shoot that, for example, Cabernet Sauvignon or Syrah. Grafted versus self-rooted, well, we can see that the own roots vines are going to produce, you know, much more water shoots in the scion at all, whether we do a high, mid or low cut, while grafted vines, you know, usually are going to have, for example, low cut, you know, we are going to have a much water shoot production in the rooftop versus the scion. You know, mid cut, you know, still we are going to have more in the scion or a high cut, we are going to have way more water shoots produced in the in the in the scion, which be in the in the trunk. So these are also different to take into consideration. Also, the time of the cut was look at, you know, winter versus spring. And basically they see no difference of making the cut uh, in winter or in spring. And the Australian conditions in the number of water shoots they were getting that growing season. When to do the cuts here in British Columbia? Well, this is a, a spore data we have of the grapevine trunk diseases. These columns here indicate the amount of spores during the different times of the year. And in a home take message is, in an ideal situation where we hope that we are gonna find healthy boot at the bottom, we're making the cut. December, January will be our best times to cut. These are what we consider our dry period. Most of the rain comes in form of snow, and we know there is almost no spore activity during that time of the of the year. December to, to, to February is probably the, the month with least amount of spores out there. If, you know, as we are observing most of our blocks, uh, uh, 15 years or older are going to have, you know, maybe making the cut at the time is going to be relevant because our vine is already infected. So, you know, <clears throat> that vine that vine has been already infected and eventually will die. So uh, making the cut in that situation would be irrelevant and it would be up to the best time for, for the grower to do that. So just to finalize, you know, in conclusion, so um, grape vine trace infection, you know, at the base of the trunk has been found in most vineyards over 15 to 20 years all in British Columbia. And this, I think, is a consequence of the lack of products we have for Basically, we started, you know, growing Betis vinifera here in the late, uh, early 1990s. And, and that has a consequence. And we haven't been able to protect this pruning wound. So the vast majority of our blocks have been infected and the infection has reached to the bottom. Uh, remedial surgery we have shown is very is effective under busy conditions and has significantly increased production uh, after three years. Even the year after, if you are able to choose these shoots, the year before you made the cuts, you can get production the year after. Even with an average of 30% canker area, you know, at the bottom of this track, the, the research we have done um, showed that renewing those vines is still worth to do it. 
And we were able to maintain those vines live and in production for up to six years. Uh, a year since we had to stop the trial. We that's that where the, the experiment finished. But you know, those vines, I'm sure they have more than six years. So the trend renew a success if we consider, you know, the vine longevity and production after the cuts are made, it's going to depend on the amount of canker area you're going to have at the bottom of the trunk, of course, and the fungal pathogens involved. If you have some of the pathogens that they are more faster colonizing and they, the, the, those cankers are moving much faster in the vines, you may have less uh, success or less years of production versus, you know, uh, the sample I show with um, those vineyards have one, what we call the slow, uh, colonizing pathogens. The vines on infection at the bottom of the trunk will eventually die. We know that. But remedial surgery can be an alternative to imminent vineyard removal, you know, allowing production so some cash uh, flow while developing and implementing a replanting plan that we are all uh, basically looking at these days. So with that, I done. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you to my team. Thank you to Dr. Marsosnowski to share data regarding the trials that have been done in Australia. Dr. Ben Min also has been sharing data to, to, to present today. And yeah, I'm very thankful to the grower that allow us to complain the remedial surgery trials. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Um, well, that was a lot of information and no time for questions. And I've got a ton of them, but um, what we'll do is Kate will share. I, I, I can stay here for some time if you want, if people want to stay. There, I know I always questions. promise yeah. a hard uh, a hard stop. So, <laughs> so yeah. you and I might know, um, but we'll, uh, Kate will share your email address again. I'm sure Definitely, people have yeah. it, but, and they can send. And, and, you know, maybe we'll do it in a way that shares with all the participants um, sure. yeah, if no we can. And this will be um, uh, uploaded onto our website within the next day or two. So anyone who wasn't able to join us can go back and, and get all this awesome information. Um, I also wanted to mention that in the next couple of days, there will be a, um, a, survey going out from the Wine Grape Council on a, a project that Ben Min and Jose are doing to collect information um, to sort of overlay onto our, our GIS platform about um, the winter kill and what kind of uh, bud break we're seeing in the various regions and also a survey regarding trunk disease so that we can um, we can go through with that. Um, Kate is saying too, if you put, if you quick type your questions into the chat, she'll, she'll be able to get them back to everyone um, in an email. So um, the other uh, thing I wanted to, yes. Pardon me, sorry, it's Tyrion. Can I yeah. just interrupt just to no, follow Tyrion. up on that no. question thing? <laughs> um, not to muscle in, I apologize. But um, just to say, to follow up, since we don't have time for questions, is the BCGA is planning on a tailgate uh, mid to late June on, on uh, trunk retraining and we are hoping it's really early days in planning but we're hoping to invite Jose um, and so that would be another time to be able to bring up uh, awesome. your questions awesome. um, and to address things like using Senator and and how to you know how to um, how, how you know whatever uh, the, okay. how to thanks Tyrion thanks um, and you know really this is this is just the best opportunity ever to retrain vines. I mean, it's forced our hand, but um, I think it's like we're going into an exciting period of vine renewal, right, Jose? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but uh, at least we have some options that we know they work and, and you know, and the main problem I find is the grower when making these, these cuts, you know, start seeing the cankers and, of course, they think of the worst, but we have been able to demonstrate that even if there is an infection at the bottom of your vines, you can get some more life and some more years of those vines. And yeah. at, the, at the very end, it's not, it's not for me because I don't understand the, the economics of the vineyards as well as you guys do, but it's all, you know, what, what is going to be the most economic thing for a grower to do, you know, yeah. pull out and replace or trying to do this extra work to, you know, to have more time, you know, for this replanting um, right. uh, situation. Thanks. Um, also, um, next, next month, so June, uh, third Thursday is June 20th and we'll have Barb Hall from UBCO talking about grafting, the, the title is crafting, grafting climate resilience, 
consideration of rootstock and new varietals for transitioning climates. So again, um, really, really pertinent to what's going on in the Okanagan right now. And um, so join us then. And thanks so much, Jose. Um, as always, so much information and such a good support to the industry. Uh, uh, thank my, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully the research, you know, is, is useful and serve, you know, growers to see the the glass half full, I know, you know, half empty. I know it's, it's yeah. very far out there now these days, but we are we are here to support and to help as much as we can. So thank you. Thanks everyone for coming and we'll see you next month.